Good day, and thank you for joining us today to discuss captive refeasibility. I'm Stephen Kashner, partner and chief actuary at Spring Consulting, and joining me today is Peter Johnson. Uh, Peter, Peter is a property and casualty actuary with Spring Consulting. Peter is a uh, fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society, and I'm a fellow of the Society of Actuaries, my focus being uh, life, health, disability, and benefits generally, and Peter's being property and casualty. We have one hour um, for, for this webinar today. We will answer your questions at the end of our presentation. Please type and submit any questions you may have. We will, we will leave plenty of time to respond to questions. The session is being recorded and will be available on request. <clears throat> Just a little bit about Spring. Spring is made up of a team of consultants and actuaries with broad insurance and captive experience with deep expertise in both property and casualty and employee benefits. Our award-winning teams always take a strategic view before focusing on execution. Today's agenda uh, yeah, to today's agenda um, will discuss the importance of refeasibility, uh, why do so, when is it appropriate to do so, and Spring's recommended captive optimization process, and finally, steps to get started. <clears throat> As you might hear, and I apologize, I do have a bit of a cold. I will ask Peter to do much of the speaking today, and I'll jump in from time to time. And with that, I'll hand it over to Peter. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we're starting out with the importance of captive refeasibility study. Um, there are various changes a company may undergo that present the need for re-examination of the company's captive. And for starters, uh, there may have been positive or negative experience. Uh, as an example of negative experience, a company may have underwent a major supply chain interruption as a retailer, and this has resulted in significant business income loss, which was not covered by insurance previously in either the captive mark, their captive or the commercial market. This may be a good time to take on a layer of risk in your captive. In addition, the captive surplus may have been released for various reasons or additions may have been made, and substantial surplus growth uh, will hopefully have uh, happened over the course of the captive's life since feasibility. Uh, now may be the time to review additional risks, such as adding a medical stop loss or a cyber risk, which wasn't previously insured by the captive. And that brings me to the next point. Uh, this is an opportunity now to add new lines of coverage that weren't previously insured in the feasibility, in the initial feasibility of the captive. Um, over the course of time, there may have been a change in the risk profile of various risks. Uh, as an example, litigiousness may be on the rise for your given company uh, in a specific geographical area that you do business in certainly seen this before and it can have very adverse effects on the, the cost of managing those risks for your company. You know, another need for re-examination are changes in regulatory environment. This is a leading issue for many CEOs and CFOs of companies and this can have either an indirect or direct impact on your company's performance and operations and does present risks to your company. Uh, there may have been changes in law. A uh, very recent example is the Abrahami case, uh, which has brought light issues of risk distribution and premium adequacy on captives, specifically uh, smaller captives in the micro market space. But nonetheless, uh, this is the time where you know, refeasibility can really address and hone in, and hone in on those issues and provide a you know, good support ongoing for the maintenance of your captive. Uh, now we're going to get into the details on the captive. 
sorry, take a step back. Importance of refusability study. Um, our spring team has the care process, which is called captive analytical risk evaluation. And this team recommends a captive evaluate its risk appetite at least every five years. And I just want to remind everybody that we are not just actuaries here. We also have consultants with expertise beyond the actuarial focus. This includes benefits, captives, and other areas of expertise. Uh, continuing on with the importance of refusability, there are key questions that can be answered in review. And this isn't meant to be an all-inclusive list. But some of these in questions include, are you still writing the right lines in your captive? Uh, upon your initial feasibility study, perhaps you had a very traditional approach and included only a couple of PNC lines of business, such as workers' compensation, general liability, perhaps auto liability. Uh, now may be time to review adding other lines, such as employee benefits or cyber are you still in the right domicile? Um, the spring team commonly performs a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, the pros and cons of what domiciles offer. Um, would a different risk structure be more profitable for the captive? Is the form of the captive still appropriate? This would include limits, retentions, reinsurance coverage, et cetera. Now may be the time to review all those. Would other service providers make a difference for your captive? Have your claims changed significantly? In the feasibility study, uh, generally the actuary and captive manager will put together expectations. An actual experience may have emerged drastically different from those original expectations in perhaps a positive or negative way. Positively being uh, claims are coming in lighter than expected and your surplus has built up beyond what was originally expected. Um, have regulations changed over the years? That's the last question on this list. Uh, again, this is not meant to be all-inclusive, and uh, today's overview doesn't focus on each of these questions, but we are happy to certainly answer these or other questions you may have. Now to move on with the captive optimization process. And this starts with the captive refusability study. There are five stages in this process. This begins with uh, assessment of the goals stage, reviewing the impact, going over the strategies, and then onto the structure, and then concludes with the measurement phase. And there is not a one size fits all approach, but through our spring care system, we follow or recommend this general evaluation structure when performing all captive refeasibility studies. Now, the first stage is the goal stage. As a company, you may have had business expansion, personnel changes, or other changes to the organization that spark changes in management's goals and resulting in changes to the risk profile of the company. Now, in this phase, in this stage, we'll be focused on confirming the original goals that were in the original feasibility study and look at what has emerged since then. What are your new goals as a company? What has resulted from changes in personnel or business expansion or contraction, for that matter? This, your company progress profile may have changed drastically because your company is getting its hands feet wet in different avenues of business, leading to additional risks uh, for your company. Now, a common way to view these risks and really assess uh, how should I handle, how should I treat this risk is this risk matrix I have off to the right. Now, there are four different treatments of risk in this matrix. And this would include the four categories, reduce, avoid, retain, or transfer. Now, to give you some examples of how you might consider a risk and how it lays into this matrix and how you should treat that risk going forward, um, let's look at one for each of these categories. So high probability, low impact 
might be short-term disability. So that's a reduced type risk. Uh, you could see a portion of that risk in your, or all that risk in your captive. A high probability, high impact would be a risk you'd ultimately want to avoid to the extent possible. But this may be an opportunity to seed a layer of it into your captive because you just can't avoid it altogether. Um, low probability, high impact type risks would be a risk you'd want to transfer into a captive mechanism or the commercial market. And cyber breach is a good example of that type of risk. It's low probability in nature. It doesn't happen very frequently, but when it does, it can have devastating impacts on a company's business, revenue, et cetera. And low probability, low impact type risks are generally risks you'll want to retain. Uh, to give you an example, uh, you may have a fleet of commercial autos that you could potentially insure the comprehensive and collision physical damage coverages in your captive, but these risks are you know, low probability, low impact in nature, and you're generally going to want to retain those. It's perhaps not worth the extra energy and expense to manage those outside of your own company. <clears throat> Continuing on with the goals stage, now that we've reviewed this risk matrix and decided on the treatment of the various risks, uh, let's, let's visit all the different possibilities of risks that you could have for your captive. What do we traditionally see in the, in the marketplace? What risks are emerging in the marketplace? And this, this is just a helpful guide to identify what common risks are included in captives these, this day and age. And to start, with, I'll have Stephen go over the employee benefits risks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, so, you know, a lot of captives, particularly ones that started many years ago, probably did not initially include employee benefits. The focus there had been, as Peter mentioned, uh, areas such as general liability and workers' comp uh, for, for health, health uh, care providers, medical malpractice, for example, was, was an early benefit in captives. Uh, but um, more, more and more these days, employers are uh, putting employee benefits into captives. And there's a couple primary reasons to do so. One is if it's a self-insured benefit, let's say uh, you decide you, um, to self-insure the long-term disability risk. Um, when you self-insure the risk, you, you can only deduct actual paid claims, um, uh, you, you know, for, 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 for tax purposes. But if you continue to pay premium into the captive, then the full premium is covered in the cap, which implies that the full reserve uh, can 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 be deducted um, from 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 taxes. Uh, so 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 yeah, so you have um, so it does make sense to to, to review any self insured employee benefits and consider putting that into the captive uh, and any fully insured programs. Uh, you know, programs such as uh, life, disability, medical stop loss, uh, even voluntary, especially voluntary benefits, I should say. They, the carriers tend to uh, include quite a bit of margin in some of those lines. And if, if you can move some of that risk, a, a layer of that risk into your captive, um, you could hold on to those margins and, and reduce your total program cost for employee benefits. Uh, so, so we're looking at AD and D, accidental death and dismemberment, life, key, key employee life insurance, long-term disability, medical stop loss, various voluntary benefits. Um, it's also uh, retiree benefits. So some of you might have closed blocks of um, retiree benefits, kind kind of frozen plans uh, that you might want to get off of your books, and a captive is a good place to uh, 
to, to move those two, uh, whether it's re retiree life, retiree medical, uh, which is very common and so forth. And on, on pension, on the pension side as well, uh, you know, if you're looking to um, close out a pension plan, terminate a pension plan, or just uh, move the risk off of your, your paper, Captive provides a, a good solution for a pension buyout or a buy-in. Thank you, Stephen. Um, some very, some of the most traditional PNC risks that you'll see in captives, uh, as we've mentioned, are your general liability types of insurance, workers' compensation on a deductible buy-down basis where you're just ensuring you deductible working layer in your captive. And those, those layers may go up to $250,000 as a large deductible, for an example. Um, auto liability and professional liabilities are other common cap coverages to include in your captive. But now with the refusability, there may be additional coverages, as we mentioned, you could revisit or visit implementing uh, directors and officers liability, as an example, cyber, uh, business interruption, uh, reputational brand risk. Uh, the, the cost of a reputation ex event, for example, could be in excess of $50,000 just to hire a PR firm to appropriately manage you know, the ongoing reputation of your firm. So this is not meant to be a comprehensive list of all the PNC coverages. Uh, and in addition, there are various enterprise risk management coverages that are commonly insured in captives. Um, also not on this list, PNC, is the idea of insuring an excess or a deductible buy-down layer uh, from what your commercial market coverage contains. So for instance, your captive may have commercial market coverage for directors and officers liability up to $5 million per occurrence limits. You may want to take an excess layer in your captive, $2 million in excess of that $5 million where the, the commercial market still insures the first $5 million per occurrence, but now your captive insures the next $2 million in excess of that $5 million. So in the event there's a $7 million event uh, resulting in loss to the company, this is now covered by both the commercial market and your captive. Hey. The, yeah, this is Stephen jumping in. I did want to remind you that we are leaving plenty of time for questions at the end. And just click on the appropriate button um, and, and, and you can type in a question and we will see that or address that at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. The next stage we have in this optimization assessment is the impact stage. How, would, how do all these different pieces of the captive puzzle fit together? Um, you know, affected by the changes you're considering, what, how do these changes affect the outlook of the captive? This can be evident in the pro forma financial analysis that the analytical team will put together uh, in both adverse case and expected case uh, sensitivity testing. And a professional captive optimizer will look to accomplish the following in this phase. Uh, conducting an, an analysis of your risk financing optimization and reviewing your current reinsurance levels and optimizing your use of reinsurance. And Stephen, I think you wanted to mention a medical stop loss example. Yeah, so, 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 so a good example on the reinsurance looking at surplus and reviewing reinsurance is medical stop loss. Sometimes when, when you put a medical stop loss program in, in place, um, you might have a good few favorable years. And if you do that, we'll build up surplus. So we, we have seen a number of programs that we work with where they might have, for example, depending upon your size, um, purchase stop loss, let's say, uh, in the captive for a layer of between $200,000 specific deductible and 500000 and then the captive would purchase excess $500,000 protection from a, re from a reinsurer. Well, so, so by, by setting up that program initially, 
the the, the margins in that two hundred to five hundred thousand dollar layer and the good experience were well retained by the captives. Surplus was able to be built up, and uh, comes two three years later. Uh, uh, you, you can look at that and say, hey, wait a second, the captive has this additional surplus. We could dividend it back. We, we can use it to, put, uh, to support other coverages, but we, we, uh, the captive can also use it to um, increase retention and instead of uh, retaining risk only up to 500000 the captive, for example, can choose to increase the retain risk up to 750000 resulting in significant additional savings on the captive stop loss program, uh, because in that case, only excess 750000 would need to be purchased. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephen. And as I mentioned, uh, stress testing these, this interaction of parts, if you will, is very important and being able to assess various adverse case outcomes. And generally how we do that, in kind of the most complex case would be run a simulation analysis and having the simulation output assess at various confidence levels how capital and surplus is gonna play out based on how all these parts move together, You know how your losses are gonna be played out, what you're assuming by the cap to what's being ceded to reinsurance, et cetera. So through the simulation analysis or through the testing of various adverse case scenarios, such as a full limit loss type scenario, you can reasonability check the outcome of your captive over the next three to five years in an adverse case scenario. The next stage is the strategies stage. What methods will you utilize in your captive refresh? So, are there any additional lines of coverage that could be insured by your captive? Now we've gone into this in detail already, but uh, during this stage we can reassess the uh, potential for additional lines to uh, be picked up by your captive, if not already assessed. Surplus management strategy is very important in this stage. And in addition to the <clears throat> pro forma financial modeling that I was going into detail on in assessing adverse case outcomes, we want to understand things on an expected level. How do we expect things to play out? And considerations also include average cost of capital, uh, what retention levels are in the captive, what is your reinsurance use? You know, additional reinsurance may mean less volatility for retained loss and capital and surplus in your captive over the next five years, but it may be at a cost. It's obviously at a cost. It can be costly to reinsure, but in certain situations, it becomes very important to reinsure very volatile layers of exposure. Taxes is another consideration. The next stage is the structure stage. How will it all look together and work together? Economic trends and market changes should give you some food for thought. Uh, as an example of you know, a market trend, use of medical stop loss in captives has been on the uprise. And in addition, cyber liability uh, insurance through your captive has been on the uprise. So this may, now that the industry is better understanding these risks and insuring them in the captives, on both sides of the spectrum, regulatory and uh, captive management. We can implement these. We have more information now to, to fully implement these into your captives, whereas this may not have been a common practice five to 10 years ago. Um, we also identify investment management best practices, as well as the optimal collateral structure of your captive. Yeah, and on the optimal collateral structure, that could be the collateral supporting uh, the, the capital in the captive, <clears throat> or and, and this applies especially for benefits um, that are often fronted programs. 
Um, the, the fronting carrier would, would require some collateral protection on the reserves that they are ceding to the captive. And traditionally, that's done through a, through a letter of credit. Of course, the letter of credit does cost some money. So, you know, an alternative, which is usually less expensive, is to set up what's called a 114 trust, uh, which is basically a, a relatively conservative assets uh, that, 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 that meet certain regulatory requirements. Um, and if that backs up the reserves, um, the, um, the fronting carrier would have a call on the on, 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 on that from, from the um, seeding company being the captive. Uh, and, and also an alternative that is available is a funds withheld approach where the uh, fronting uh, seeding company just holds on to the assets and, and pays an investment return on them. <clears throat> so those are some of the things that can be looked at uh, when uh, reviewing the the structure of the program. Okay, thank you, Stephen. The last stage is the measurement stage. A professional consultant will develop implementation plans based on findings and make actionable recommendations for achieving the goals established in phase one. So at the conclusion of this measurement phase, a report is going to be produced. And in this report is you know the actual technical support as well as the narrative that describes the, the, the inner workings of the analysis and the results and our recommendations. And a couple of things I wanted to also bring up is this idea of uh, risk distribution and price inadequacy. This is the result of the Abrahami issues that came up. Uh, these were two issues pointed out by the commissioner versus Abrahami and were ruled on by the judge. Uh, it's you know, certainly very important to spring in uh, as far as how we do our analysis to, to provide the technical support to address these various issues of risk distribution and price inadequacy. And are risks actually being transferred to your captive? You know, there needs to be risk there. And we illustrate that in our, in our reports. All right, so um, time to get started. Uh, as we discussed, there, there, there's surely bound to be a number of factors that have changed since your captive was first created. You might have uh, new personnel, for, for one thing, which are who, um, in the risk area, in the, in the finance area, in the um, benefits area that have... Uh, so some, some different thinking and different ideas. Uh, there's certainly industry changes that have taken place. Uh, we, uh, you're probably aware of some of them. We could help you uh, re review for other changes that have taken place and other considerations that you might want to make. Uh, so, so, so we believe it is a, a great time to have a uh, professional you know, you know, captive uh, consultant and actuarial professionals T take a snapshot of your current performance, help you uh, project where that's going forward, and and help you determine some strategies for um, use of the captive in the future to, to optimize the captive if you desire to grow the captive. Uh, and, and, and Spring does have a full team of captive insurance and actuarial experts. We're really ready to help you strategize and, and, and dive into the process and, um, and work on your optimization. So, um, so that's the end of our formal presentation. We do have a few questions that came in, but we have plenty of time left and we do encourage additional questions. Uh, so, so the first question that came in is, what um, new coverages are trending into captives? And I'll ask Peter to answer that question. Yep. Um, great question. Uh, cyber liability, of course, uh, over the last five years has really been on the uprise and 
you know, you see news all the time on cyber breaches and, and this risk has been taken on by captives in many small captives and large captives. A medical stop loss, which Stephen could speak uh, well to, has been on the uprise over the last five years as well. Uh, these are risks that are becoming very familiar with regulators, which is a great thing, and they see these coming through captives all the time. Hey. And I will add on, just because Peter mentioned medical stop loss, there, there are two primary approaches there. Uh, existing captives, pure captives, for example, might want to uh, put in their own uh, medical stop loss pro program in, into their own pure captive. But, but, but another uh, practice that's becoming more and more prevalent is uh, to get involved with a group captive program, perhaps through a uh, cell ca captive structure, and um, and and share risk uh, with, with other like-minded employers as well. So 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 both of those avenues are available, and um, we, we can walk help you think through the pluses and minuses of of the alternatives that are out there. I mean, the, the, the medical stop loss has, in particular, has been, uh, picked up quite a bit since the uh, Accountable Care Act came into place uh, um, uh, to, to help employers uh, just be responsible for their own risk as opposed to the risk of a larger insured pool of employers. Um, and at the same time, as part of the Accountable Care Act, the, um, the previously medical benefits may have been limited to a million dollars lifetime, or um, or two million dollars lifetime, et cetera. And the Accountable Care Act removed any of those limitations. So now it's unlimited risk, and it's more important to think about the. Uh, any reinsurance protection that, that might be needed there. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, I, 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 uh, the next question that came in is um, why use a cell captive uh, versus a pure captive? What would be the considerations for that? And I'll try to answer that question. Um, you know, one of the things that a uh, cell captives are being used um, more and more these days uh, for for people getting into captives for the first time is certainly a quick and easy way to get in uh, because the structure's already there. The legal accounting audit uh, captive manager functions are already uh, built in, so it really becomes a turnkey. Solution: The actuarial support can be built in. Um, yeah. So, uh, but you know, there are lots of circumstances. Uh, it still makes sense to stick with a pure captive, and, and there are a, a number of other captive forms that are out there that are becoming more and more prevalent today, and, and that. Uh, should be part of your review process to see if you're using the right uh, uh, captive structure or whether it makes sense to change to another structure or, or, or join a cell or um, et cetera. So um, that's, that's an important piece of your review. That was, thank you for that question. Uh, and we've got one more question that, that's out there. Um, right now, and, and and it's an interesting question. Um, the you know well, what what's with potential tax reform coming down the road? I know the uh, legislator, the, the you know Congress has taken a look at that. Is looking at considering uh, reductions in corporate tax rates. How might that? Uh, impact uh, use of captives? And I'll ask Peter that question. Well, I think it's uh, certainly important to keep in mind the you know, 
this may be a resulting benefit of setting up a captive, the tax savings, but resulting this tax reduction would result in certainly less tax savings from that perspective. But we don't want to take away from the other benefits uh, and reasons for setting up a captive. You know, there are numerous expense savings that companies will see from setting up a captive, not just in the, the tax area, but operational costs that were originally passed on to commercial insurers that are now uh, really being created as extra profits for either the company or built into the captive to build up surplus. So it would have an impact, but uh, it should be negligible at the end of the day in terms of the, your overall view on the captive. And I will add, and of course you guys as captive owners are well, are well aware of, of this, but uh, you, 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 know, you set up a captive because it's a place where you can manage and uh, risks in, 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 a, in, a, in a meaningful way, diversify the risks w within the captive, and, uh, and, and really provide uh, some transparency uh, to your uh, insurable risks and, uh, and, and thereby influencing the management of, that, of, of those risks. So, so all of those primary uh, reasons for working with a captive do, do remain. And uh, so uh, interesting question. We'll see what develops from, uh, from, from Congress over time and uh, keep an eye on that. At this point, I believe we're not seeing any other questions. So you can have the rest of your afternoon or if you're on the West Coast, the rest of your morning back and enjoy the day. Uh, you can see uh, our contact information up there now for Peter and, and for myself. Uh, please uh, you know, send us any follow-up questions. Uh, we will send the, uh, a copy of the recording of the session to you. And we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you.